welcome to the Podium Life Podcast, where we discuss how to live a podium life. I am your host and favorite Olympian, Michelle Carter, a.k.a. Shot Diva. Let's get into this episode. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Podium Life Podcast. I'm so excited to uh, be back with you all with podcast number three. I can't believe it. Like, I am really am doing this. Now, today, this week's episode was pushing it for me. I had all the time in the world, then all of a sudden, where did the time go? Like, I know I'm not the only person who experienced that when you plan for things and things don't go according to plan. And sometimes you just don't feel like it. And then you forgot you had to do this. And then this happens. And next thing you know, it's the day before. Not even day because it's nighttime now. The night before, something needs to be done. And you're just not getting around to it. That's me today. <laughs> but I said, I got to do it. Do it, do it, do it, do it, do it now. Do it good. Do this podcast like I should right now. <laughs> so we're doing this podcast. Um, so last week we had my dad on there, which was pretty fun and pretty cool. Um, my dad told some stories he's never told before. Now the story about my dad getting shot, I had to really kind of do some convincing Um for that to happen, for him to tell that story. But um, it was great to have my dad on there and to have him just really kind of open up because my dad doesn't like to do interviews, but he said, you know what, you're my daughter. I'll make an exception for you. And I'm like, thank you, daddy. I appreciate it. So last week, um, it was the 49ers and Cowboys game. And y'all know there's like this whole rivalry between the Cowboys and the 49ers. So I have this little spot that I go to and I go kick it and watch the games with these people. And I don't wear a team. Like I don't claim a team. I don't have a team. Yes, I'm a 49er baby, but when I went to college and I got to know like other football players, I started cheering for people that I know. So I never really had a team because people that I knew played for different teams. But then of course, 49ers will always have a special place in my heart because that's my childhood. But then also, yeah, I live in Dallas, Texas. I'm surrounded by cowboy stuff, like cowboy fans, cowboy stuff. I live close to the cowboy stadium. Like, yes. <laughs> so I have a soft spot for them too because it's the home team. When Dallas wins, when the Cowboys win, Dallas is crunk. Dallas is happy. Dallas is excited. Everybody want to speak and say hi. Oh, but when the Cowboys lose, the fans are horrible. If you haven't seen it on Instagram and all those other things, like people are throwing their TVs outside. People are punching their TVs. Y'all are tearing up y'all TVs over a football game. I don't understand it. I do not understand it, but that's what's been happening. Like people take their teams very seriously and the Cowboys, America's team, their fan bases, they, they a little out there. They're crazy, but you know, it's always a good time. So anyways, back to the story. Um, so I knew that people were going to try to wait to see and see who I was going to really support on that day. So normally I don't wear a team. I don't, I don't have any shirts like that, but of course I have a few 49er sweaters and sweatshirts and things of that nature. So I showed up in a 49er, a 49er sweatshirt, but it wasn't like your regular red, bright red and orange. I mean, and gold, it was like burgundy, but then it had like 49ers like right here in the corner and then on the back it says Carter and then it has number 95, which is my dad's number. And so when I walked in the room, everyone was like, Michelle, it was like, oh, like why you do us like that? I can't give you a hug, you wearing, and it, it was just funny. I wore it just for the pure reaction of people and I got exactly what I wanted. And so it was fun, I had a good time, but y'all, just been watching the Cowboys all this time. It's, 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 it's hard when people really want them to win. And we think that they have the talent to win. And then for every time it comes down to y'all execute it, it just doesn't quite happen. <sighs> I don't even want to get into all the theories of why, but you know, there's this guy named Jerry Jones that might be too involved, but 
I don't know. It brings me back to some of the points that we talk about with podium mind, uh, with podium, um, the podium podcast. And one of the first things that I talk about is that mindset. Now, these last two games the, uh, the Cowboys played were probably like the best games they've ever played in a long time. They looked like they wanted it. They were going after it. They were executing. Like something about playing in the fourth quarter when it's almost over, you have nothing to lose. People really like ram it up. Like really like, okay, we got to go get it. We got to make this happen. But how come you can't play like that all the time? So same thing like in sports, we want to practice at 50%. And then we want to go to the game. And then we want to play play at 100%. But we've only been able to handle 50% because that's the max we've ever done. Same thing for preseason and offseason. People don't take preseason as serious sometimes until it comes down to, oh, we need one more game to win to make it to the next round. But how come you can't play every game as if? It was the last round. Push yourself. Be your best every single time you step on the field. And then I know with so many games, it's hard. And you do have to have a little strategy to it, especially if you're talking about basketball. They play in 135, 50 games. I don't even know why, but that's what they do. You do have to be strategic with it. But when you step on the court, you're giving your all and you're pushing yourself past the limit because you don't know when you're going to need that extra umph. And so, so learning how to go all in pretty much all the time. And I think in life and a lot of things that we do professionally, personally, we put in the least amount of effort until we have to put in the effort. Then you, the six weeks come and you realize you have a 70 and you need an 85 to stay eligible. And then all of a sudden you want all the extra credit. You want all the extra things to get it done. You're asking, what can I do to bring my grade up? But if you had that attitude from jump, how much better would you be? You wouldn't even experience the stress of doing things last minute if you were doing things right the first time, if you were actually going 100% all the time. And y'all not saying I'm perfect at that because your girl has ADHD and I get distracted 15, 11 times. But, <laughs> you know, I can focus when I want to if something has my attention. But with that, I am a little bit all over the place and I like the pressure of last minute. I do. I'm not going to lie. I like the pressure of last minute. So something that I do and that my dad and I, we did at practice, we will paint scenarios at practice to create that pressure of the last minute. Like how can I put that pressure on me when the pressure is not on me to help push myself past what I'm used to, where I've been, so I can keep pushing the bar for myself. And it's been interesting that over time, he didn't have to start creating scenarios. I created my own scenarios. So if you remember in the last episode, we talked about how 2016 was the year of the last throw. I won indoor world, last throw. Won the Olympic trials, last throw. Won the Olympic games, last throw. Because I always had, I don't say I always had, I developed over time the mentality that the competition is not over until it's over. I don't care how far behind I am, I'm one throw away from winning. I'm one throw away from a PR. I'm one throw away being the best that I ever could be. Is this the moment? And I say like, we get six throws if you make it to the finals. So I wanna make every single throw count. Now, does it happen all the time? No, sir, no ma'am, it does not, but I'm able to get into these situations and not feel the pressure of the moment and crumble. And I think a lot of teams get to the playoffs, especially if they haven't had the best year or if they just kind of started having really good years and it's their first time on the big stage. You put all this pressure on yourself and you haven't operated in this type of pressure all year long. And then somewhere along the way, you just crumble up and, and you fail or you don't do as well as you would like to. Um, a good example of that was TCU at the um, versus Georgia at the um, um, national championship for NCAA football. TCU been killing it all year long. They had one loss. Been playing, 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 killing it, killing it, killing it, killing it 
all of a sudden they get to um, the national champion and they play like they never played before, meaning they played scared. They let the pressure of the moment get to them. And you have to figure out how to feel pressure, but still stand tall in those moments. And it doesn't happen just all of a sudden, now that you're here, you figure out how to cut this switch on, you practice the switch at practice, you practice switching this switch up in games when you're not doing, like when you're not really getting challenged, but you still need to push yourself, you create scenarios so you can learn how to turn that switch on and off that when you need to step it up a not notch and go all the way out. And so, um, I really felt bad for TCU because I think there was their first, I'm not sure if it was their first time ever at the national championship. I can't remember, but I know if it, if it was, they were there for the first time in a very long time. And when you haven't actually experienced that level, it can be overwhelming and you don't know what to do. But one thing I say that I really truly enjoyed having my dad as a coach is that he's been where I wanted to go. So he already had like tips and tricks to teach me from jump to um, how to overcome those moments when you're at the biggest stage or when you're when you're behind and it's the last throw and you're sitting in sixth place. Like, what do you do in these scenarios? So if I, um, I actually take my very first Olympic games in 2008 and I was so nervous, y'all. I was so nervous. I didn't even know what to do with myself. And so me being so nervous at my first Olympic games, the stadium was freaking huge. I still to this day have not competed in front of a crowd as large as the 2008 Beijing Olympic Games. That stadium was packed. Um, London was packed, but London Stadium wasn't as big as Beijing. And then of course, when we get to 2016, we in Rio and then Zika's there and nobody shows up because everybody's scared of Zika. So still to this day, I have not competed in a stage or a stadium as big or as full as Beijing, China. And this is my very first professional international competition. Well, that's a lie. Not my first international competition, but my first like international senior team competition. I, it's the Olympic Games. I just graduated from college in the fall of 07. Six months later, seven months later, I'm at the Olympic Games. And I remember walking through the tunnel because you go, we warm up in another field and everything was kind of a little spread out. We had to drive over to the stadium, walk through the stadium. Then we get to the gate where we're going to come out and we're getting ready to walk on the field. Now, sometimes they have curtains there so that you can't really see out. In my mind, I feel like there were curtains. So I always say there was curtains. Can't truly remember because, you know, that was a long time ago. But, um... I remember just walking out and people are screaming and there's lights and cameras everywhere. Like you go from this dark tunnel to all of this light. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? <laughs> there's so many people. And I remember looking at the top of the stadium thinking to myself, like, are these people even real? Like, are they moving? Because they're so far away. I cannot tell if these people up there are real. Because it they weren't, like, I, they're so far away, I couldn't tell. And then I think I saw, like, a flag move. And I'm like, okay, they're real. Like, this is crazy. There's so many people here. And then the next thought was, where is my mama? <laughs> so my very first Olympic game, my dad didn't go um, because he um, he was having hips and, and knee surgeries and, you know, football caught up with him. So he didn't go with me, but my mom was there. And I'm thinking about, like, how can I find my mom in this stadium? But I did find her, by the way. And I remember we get to the stadium, and we're in the stadium, and then they walk up to the shot put ring. Like, we got to walk in this single line, and we walking around, and they bring us to our area. Then everybody spreads out, get their little spot, change their shoes, put the tape on, get their chalk ready, whatever they do to get ready for the competition. We have a few moments to do that. And then we start our warm-up. And in, in these international competitions, we get one, we actually supposed to get two throws. And then whatever extra time we have, you can get another throw, but you have to go in the order of which you're going to actually compete in. And so you get your throws, you get ready. And I'm thinking to myself, like, I'm at the Olympic Games. 
Michelle, we are at the Olympic Games. And I kind of psyched myself out just a little bit because I had put so much on this one moment. It was my first Olympic Games. I'm not guaranteed another one. I didn't go to opening ceremonies. I went to training camp. Like when I tell you I did the minimum that I can do because I'm like, I got to make sure I'm prepared. I got to make sure I'm right. I got to keep my mind focused. And I'm, I put so much stress on trying to protect my energy and trying not to freak out that I'm at the Olympics. But then I'm like, I'm at the Olympics. This is crazy. And I was a little dead in that competition. I did my best, but I wasn't all the way like my fiercest. I wasn't totally 100% shot diva in that moment because she was scared. She was so nervous. So I competed and I finished 15th. And then from that moment moving forward, I have realized and talking to my dad, y'all, this is just another track meet. Nothing changed. The rules didn't change. My shot put didn't change. The ring that I throw out of didn't change. The only thing that changed was the location and maybe the how many people are in the ring, but it's still a regular track meet. The process is still the same. So if I can go throw well and there's nobody there and I can't throw well when everybody is there only because the title of the track meet changed, and I have to start changing my mind to prepare and think that, Michelle, this is just a track meet. I'm going to treat every track meet like it's the Olympics because it's just a track meet. It's just got a different name. Every track meet has a name, right? There's a title of the track meet. So when I started to adopt that mentality, the nerves going to these track meets weren't as bad. Like I always have like competition nerve where you be like, oh, I'm about to go. Oh, like I got to go do this. Like I'm ready. Oh, you know, I hope all the hard work I've done that showed up. Like, let's go. Like I'm going to always have those type of nerves, but it's not the nerves that actually like deadens me, that drags me and makes me tired. But when, um, to bring it back around. So I think what got into TCU's head was that they were at the national champion. Instead of looking at it that this is another football game and executing the way that they have every single time, they could have won. But the one thing that Georgia had over them is that they've been here recently. They know exactly what to do. They've, they're they used to this type of pressure. We've been here, done that. We learned our lesson. We adjusted. Now we're about to go out here and kick your butt. And they played like that. So that's why we talk about in the podium life this podium lifestyle is that you have to have a certain mentality that no matter what you come across, you have this like routine on how you're going to approach something. Because when you have a routine, you go into this, um, what do you call it? Like it's almost automatic. Like you're almost going on this um, um, robotic routine that keeps you in a familiar, comfortable spot. And when you're able, and I just read this in my book. Oh my gosh, let me see if I can pull it up real quick. I'm reading this book, 12, 12, um, a 12 year, 12 week year. And it talks about having routines because when we have routines, routines can show up for us in ways that willpower can't. And we underestimate of approaching things the same way every time. For me, I have a meat routine. Um, my meat routine isn't like I got to have a certain kind of food or certain this, but I wake up, depending on what time my meat is, um, I shower, got my little music on, take a shower, then I let myself cool off, then I do my hair, then I do my makeup, I lay down my uniform, I put my numbers on, I go through my bag and make sure all my things are in there, and I have like my slow music going on, then I call my daddy, then I might call my mom, depending on how I'm feeling, and then um, I start to get dressed and there's like a time frame that I need to be downstairs. I know my time frame because I don't want to rush. I'm going to take my time getting there. So I get dressed and then as I get dressed, put my uniform on, I put my shades on, I put my earbuds in. And once I put them earbuds in to walk out that door, y'all, that gospel music is gone. Well, not gospel in general, but all that slow, keep you even kill music is gone. Your girl is crunk, right? I got Lecrae on, Tadashi, I got um, Lil John, I got whatever music is popping that time that I'm feeling that's going to get me crunk, that's what I'm playing. Like, I put on, like, everything in that moment changed because now I've gone through my routine and my body knows, flip the switch. 
let's go. And so having certain routines to get things done um, is good. And then this is actually so powerful for me in this moment. I tell y'all, this podcast is more for me than it is for y'all half the time because I am actually having to apply this in my regular everyday life. I am no longer an athlete that has to do certain things anymore. Like my whole routine that I was once used to is different now. I don't have to get ready for a track meet. I don't have to do certain kind of workouts to get this kind of result. Like everything has changed. I'm so sad that I can't find it right now. But um, so having these um, like a routine can help get you into the right mindset so that in no matter what, I can go through this routine and I'm ready because it's like an automatic trigger for me. And I do that for every track meet. So it doesn't matter what track meet it is, how big or how small, my mind knows once we get dressed, put them shades on and put those earbuds in, Shot Diva is now here. She has arrived. Don't look at me. Don't talk to me. If you say hi, wave and keep it moving. Like my whole face, my whole demeanor changed because I'm about that business. And now I'm learning that I have to actually take that same mindset into the regular world and whatever endeavors that I'm doing now. And so it says, okay, if you have the book, all right, if you have the book, I think this is what I'm looking for. It's page 106 of the 12 week year. It says, if you're going to achieve what you are capable of, you can't leave it up to willpower alone. Process controls uses tools and events to create support structures that can, girl, you know, okay. Anyway, they create support structures. And in some cases, it takes place of willpower. So having this structure, having this same thing that you do all the time gets things done and puts you in a certain mind frame um, that sometimes just trying to make yourself do it doesn't work. So I wish I can really find the part that like this just came to me like out of the blue. So I don't really have it all right here. But creating that routine of what you would do to help yourself be your best every single time. I think that's so important because it helps put you in a certain mind frame and a mindset that kind of helps all of a sudden to come on automatically. So, yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I really felt bad for the kicker for the Cowboys because the game before that, he missed four field goals. And then the new game, he missed one, but he made some others. So, you know. He was able to to make it up. But sometimes we get so pressured in doing something we know we are good at and that we can do it with our eyes closed. But for some reason, we put more emphasis on one than the other when it's all the same. The football field never changed. The basketball court doesn't change. It's the same size. The ball's the same. The goals are same length apart. There's the same number of players on the field. Same thing in soccer, whatever sport. The things are the same. So stick to what you know so you can go out there and perform at your best. Learn how and figure out your routine that's going to put that, that's going to click that switch for you so you can go out there and be your best and live that podium life. So y'all, I guess that's the word of like the word of the day. You know what I didn't do y'all? Oh my gosh. I didn't even, see this is we working, right? We, we working through this. I didn't even get my quotes uh, or my, um, <laughs> or my uh, fun facts of the day. Lord have mercy. I, I am a little bit all over the place, but the funny part is I do have a fun fact for the day. Um, I saw this on Instagram and I thought about doing it for the podcast and I'm like, oh no, this would be too funny. But here, here we go. We we going for it because we got to get this done. Did y'all know that 99% of a fart is made from non-smelly gas? 75% of those non-stinky gases are methane, hydrogen, and carbon dioxide. Hydrogen and, meth- and methane are flammable, which is why you can actually light your farts. <laughs> 
why is that a fun fact? Because I need y'all to know these weird facts. I came across it today and I'm like, this would be a perfect fun fact for one day. But guess what that day is? The day is today. Because I'm not as prepared as I should be today. And um, I don't have a quote for today um, that I have prepared. But just know, I guess this could be the quote. Um, find a routine that helps you flip the switch. I don't think that wants to be the quote. I don't need to be figuring it out. It just is what it is today, y'all. So I thank you all so much for tuning in to podcast number three of the Podium Life podcast with your favorite Olympian, Michelle Carter. That's me, aka Shot Diva. And if you have any questions or comments, um, please email me at I, at I am Michelle Carter at gmail.com. And y'all, we are living this journey together so that we can live a podium life, which is living life a step above the rest so we can reach our full potential together. I told y'all this is just as much for me as it is for you because while I'm going through this transition, I still want to live a podium life, be the best that I can be, give it 100%, and um, we're going to see where life takes us and what are the new heights from here. So have a great day. Make sure you subscribe, and I will talk to you guys later. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Podium Life Podcast. I hope this episode adds value to your journey of building your podium life. Make sure you subscribe to not miss a single episode and leave us a review. Make sure to go to thepodiumlifepodcast.com to keep the conversation going. Until next time.